Welcome back to Turpentine VC, a podcast where we discuss the art and science of building successful venture firms, VC to VC. Today's episode is a special one. CJ Gustafsson, host of Run the Numbers, a Turpentine Network podcast, joins me in interviewing Tomas Tongas. Tom is a general partner at Theory Ventures, an early stage firm he founded in 2022 after 14 years at Redpoint Ventures. We discuss the Theory Ventures model, the coming contraction in investable VC dollars, Tom's contrarian view on blockchain, the parallels between PE and VC, and much more. Here's our conversation. Tom, welcome to the podcast or podcasts. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, thrilled to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So, Tom, let's start with the the theory behind theory. Uh, what, what, you know, given that you're entering a very crowded uh, venture market, how did you think about? Hey, where do you want to fit in within the within the ecosystem? Where did you want to differentiate? Walk us through kind of the idea maze of how you thought about you know, get, you're getting your fund off the ground and, and where you wanted to play when you thought about fund size, when you thought about portfolio construction, where you thought about where you wanted founders to see you in market compared, compared to all these other amazing firms that have been around for a long time. Yeah, great question. I mean, there are a lot of wonderful firms out there. The way that we think about ourselves is we we initially started by using math to create portfolio construction. And so we started running Monte Carlo analysis on historical venture returns to come up with a Basically, a thesis-driven, highly concentrated portfolio where we research spaces for long periods of time, try to understand the entire landscape, and then invest at the early stage and continue to invest as companies grow. That's the the core idea. And today, we're a team of six people all pursuing that vision. Yeah. And and you have unique insights on um, portfolio construction in terms of you want it to be more 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 concentrated, higher ownership. Um, talk about how, how you got to, to conviction on, on that being the, the, the right opportunity. Yeah, I think there's probably there's two dominant models in venture capital. I think there's the you would call it like the Y Combinator build an index, very, very broad, and then ideally have a growth fund or a mid stage fund to be able to pick up the winners and then concentrate. And then the other is what you might call the classical venture model, which is very early bets with significant ownership where over time you're able to drive a, a lot of returns for, for investors. And we think the U.S. US venture capital asset class grew from about 8 to $300 billion over the last 12 years. 81% of those dollars, according to PitchBook, are from non-traditional VCs. And as we start our firm, one of the things that we need to do, and this is the advice that we give to startups, is we need to focus <laughs> to be able to win. And so our goal is, is to be able to focus on categories that we really care about go really deep. And then once we have a lot of conviction in those businesses, help them grow as quickly as you can, both with advice, but also capital. And that $300 billion number, where do you expect that to be in the next, uh, in the next few years? Yeah, I think it settles to somewhere around like 150 to 180 would be my guess. Um, so pretty significant correction. Uh, obviously the vast majority of those dollars are kind of in the mid to late stage, just sort of definitionally. Um, so I, I think, and where will it be in five or 10 years is much harder to predict, but I do think over the last 10 years, the venture capital asset class has become institutionalized. If you think about like Dave, what David Swenson did at Yale, 30 to 50% in privates, uh, that's here to stay. And a bi- one big part of it is index investing is dominate the public markets. And the second is the total number of publicly traded companies in the U.S. is significantly less. And the last part is... 25 years ago, a company with 25 million in trailing could go public. Today, you probably need 150 million in trailing. So if you're an institutional investor and you want exposure to some of these mid-stage, early mid-stage companies, the only way to, to do that is through privates. Yeah. And so if, if we go down from 300 to, to 180 or 150, almost, you know, o- o- almost a cut in half, where does that get cut from? Is it, is it multi-stage firms just lower their fund size significantly? Is it just that there's no new entrance? Is it that a lot go out of business? Is it all the above? How does that happen? Yeah, I think, well, one, you have hedge funds who are public and private. They look at, I would imagine they're looking at public multiples on a relative basis and thinking that the public markets are more attractive. You look at, if you want to play the AI trend as an institutional investor, Microsoft is actually a really phenomenal way of doing that. Um, and so I wonder if some of the hedge fund money moves out. The second is the really big growth funds will be much harder to raise than they have been in the past. Uh, and the top firms will continue to do that. But, um, you know, the, they called, and I just learned this term uh, during the fundraisers, uh, staple funds. And that, that term means 
raise an early stage fund and then I have a growth fund and they're called staple because in order to invest $1 in the early fund, you must invest 2 or $3 in the growth fund. I think that dynamic may change. And so you'll, I think you'll see a lot less later stage capital for this reason. Yeah. And so what's your advice to emerging managers? I mean, you, know, you, you are an emerging manager, although you know, at a, quite a big fund. A lot of emerging managers listening to this thinking about, hey, what, what's the market like? How, how big of a fund can I raise? But also, what is an approach that will resonate with, with LPs in this market? How, when you're ad- advising emerging managers, what, what is some of the non-common advice that you're, you're giving? I think the most important thing, well, one, if a strong track record with DPI, I think, is the golden ticket in this ecosystem. The other, so I would say like six months ago or nine months ago, the fundraising market was quite difficult. And that's just because many LPs were reevaluating their investments. And there was obviously the U.S. public markets crash, the geopolitical tensions with China, the real estate implications or the implications to real estate of 400 basis points of increase in the Fed funds rate, what that means for the value of those assets. I think at this point, a lot of the repricings of the private portfolios have come through and limited partners or investor, institutional investors have a better sense of where they stand, um, which is a good thing. I think what I've been hearing from the institutional investor base is that smaller funds is where many institutional investors would like to be because the multiples are higher. Uh, And so the most important thing is to be able to find LPs who are interested in potentially moving from like bigger multi-stage down to smaller, smaller funds and asking qualifying questions about how many emerging managers have you backed in the last 18 to 24 months is a really good way of figuring out whether that LP could be a fit. And, and what types of strategies do you think are most differentiating? You know, people are asking, should I differentiate on, on sector specific? Should I differentiate on geo specific? Should I try to do something different with portfolio construction? Um, what, what do you think are the types of strategies that really resonating in market out, outside of sort of, hey, we've got some DPI, you know, it's great references, et cetera? I think that the really important question when you have a startup is I, I have a product idea, I have a product, and I have a go to market strategy, and they all need to align. And the companies that work really well are the ones that are able to draw a line through those three points. I think it's the same for early stage fund managers where you can focus on AI, super crowded category. If you have a proprietary network or access, you can make it work. Uh, You can come up with a different sort of fund strategy. There are a handful of friends who are starting SaaS roll-up funds where they buy companies that are not they're growing at like 10 to 20 percent 10 to 30 percent and profitable and they're rolling them up as a way of creating a next generation constellation which is a publicly traded company that does this and so i think it's just about like the consistency of vision and some specialization that's defensible and it's not that there's like a unique specialization but just as long as it's like a, a very consistent story you can be you can be in a good place Totally. I want to transition a little bit into, you mentioned AI earlier and how Microsoft could, could play. H- how are you approaching v- uh, AI as, as a venture capitalist in terms of where do you think are opportunities uniquely suited for, for, venture, for uh, venture investors to, to, to play and invest in, uh, and, and make money from? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think, so at the highest level, okay, who's earning the most money from AI right now? It's, it's open AI, like 1.3, 1.5 billion in run rate. That's what they've said. Microsoft has two businesses that when you total them are roughly the same size and then they're sort of everyone else. The foundation model is a really difficult place. I think for small venture firms like ours to play just because of the capital intensity of those businesses, um, where we're spending a lot of time is trying to understand, uh, the, so one, the tooling, like we, we uh, interviewed a bunch of data leaders, uh, about 25 of them over the last couple of months and only one had actually deployed an LLM inside of production. The major challenge there is just understanding the risks associated with moving data into and out of LLMs and containing it. So there, one of our themes is just enterprise readiness around large language models. If you're a Goldman Sachs, if you're a Fidelity, if you're a Nike, how do you become comfortable uh, with these kinds of issues? I went to dinner with a friend yesterday who works at a publicly traded company, and um, she she raised this issue around terms and conditions or who has the indemnification what indemnification exists if I'm using a, an image generation software. And so there, there's just a lot of these questions that have yet to be asked and answered around the, the use of LLM. So we're spending a lot of time around the developer tooling, the infrastructure. And then the second part is 
at the application layer. So it's clear you can't, you can't beat Salesforce with an LLM enabled CRM. You can't beat Zendesk with an LLM enabled customer support tool. And our current working hypothesis is that there, you, there's a, an opportunity to redefine categories. So there's a CRM category and there's a marketing category. Uh, and those have been sort of etched into the fabric of how we sell and, and build and buy software. And we're starting to wonder whether, you know, these, these large language models, you, you can use English as an API. You can, you can write something and it'll translate it to what a computer understands and bring you the data back. But well, what if you could, what if you could combine CRM and a marketing software in one or uh, the entire go to market functions in a single stack? What would that look like? So that's a, that's a theme that we're currently researching is how do you redefine the way that people think about these categories? That's a helpful overview. Um, what are other areas that you're particularly interested in, in, in investing in or sort of, uh, where you, where you think there's lots of opportunities for startups. And you'd like to see more startups pursue, um, companies in, in, in this area or companies of, of this type. Yeah, we're keen on the modern data stack. So if you look at the, the vendor Q3 data, BI uh, databases, that's a single fastest growing category for spend. The uh, second is security. And so we're, we spend a lot of time in the modern data stack, next generation databases, uh, streaming, that kind of thing. And then the last is blockchains as databases. So we look at Ethereum. It's worth about 250 billion, fastest growing database company of all time, worth five snowflakes put together. And one of our long-term theses is that many future software products will be built with Web3 components embedded inside of them. And so those are the three areas where we spend time uh, in addition to AI. It's contrarian to be thinking about blo blockchain uh, applications in 2024. It, it, <laughs> it is. It is. I mean, I think we've, got, we've gone through this bear market and it's been a really healthy development because what we would have called like the projects of the 2020 and 2021 era where a pitch deck didn't have any notion of like revenue or cost of customer acquisition or any of the economics of a business. Now that's changing many web three companies. And I think it's a very healthy development are now starting to think about what kind of businesses can we build? Which buyers do we sell to? How do we package up the core technologies that are fundamental innovations and really meaningful and, and solve an end user problem that doesn't have to do with a stable coin movement or decentralized finance, but is solving like a real, real enterprise need. That's, that's well said. I, I want to ask one more question, then I'll pass it over to my co-host, CJ. Um, you gave a talk at Angelus Confidential uh, a, a year ago, where you kind of uh, talked about some of the biggest data trends of the of the year in, in, in the space. If, if you were giving that same talk this year, and it just happened, so maybe you did give, give, give that talk, um, what, what, what would be some of the biggest uh, points that you'd, uh, you, you would emphasize in, in, in that talk today? Yeah, I think the first thing is, historically, data teams have been... Um, well, I guess, but let me put it this way. Data teams are becoming software engineering teams. Historically, they've lived sort of downstream of the, the, the analysis, right? You build a product, the product produces data, your customers do stuff that produces data, and then you ship it to the data team and they do a bunch of post hoc analysis. Now data is becoming fundamental to the building of applications, right? personalization or risk scoring or uh, chatbots. All And so the data teams and the software engineering teams are converging. And that's, there's a... Um, there's a lot of, of opportunity to build software to enable that to happen because you, have, you, you know, that hasn't existed before. The second one are the applications of machine learning within data. So there's two big problems with these, with these large language models that are relevant to data. The first is they're non-deterministic. That's a fancy word that means if I ask it the same question twice, it will give me two different answers, which is really hard. If you're the CEO of a business and you ask a BI system, what is my revenue by region? For a, for a particular product, it will give you one answer. But if you ask it, uh, you know, what is my revenue by region and product? And then if I flip it and if I say, what is the revenue by product and region? I'll get two different answers. That's, that's a big problem for data. Uh, and then the second is the hallucinations. So, uh, I think there's a significant amount of opportunity to solve those problems and then also bring more sophisticated data analysis to people who may not speak SQL, like text to SQL is uh is a huge movement and um many companies are spending a lot of a lot of time and then the last is what i would call the um, small data movement so the laptop that is in front of me today is more powerful than the server the third the third most powerful server that snowflake used to build snowflake in 2012 so i can manage exactly the same volumes of data on this macbook 
as uh, as Snowflake could in that era. And so there's this big drive now to take advantage of the fact that I can develop locally, I can process huge reams of data. You know, I'm running uh, some large language models on these machines. And as a way of both reducing cost and improving the developer experience for people manipulating data, you have next generation databases that operate uh, and data analysis systems that operate and take advantage of the fact that I have this incredibly beefy machine uh, at home. Those would be the top three. Well said, C CJ, take it over. I just want to say up front that uh, I'm pumped to be here and included in this jam session. The lineup already had 88 Jordan Pippen vibes, and then someone accidentally invited the Horace Grant of SAS metrics. So, <laughs> so uh, excited to Horace be here. Grant, even with the glasses, remember those days? <laughs> I thought about wearing glasses to this to make the joke really stick, but uh, I didn't know if it would land. Uh, all right, on to more important things here. Uh, you know, I wanted to say that your writing is super well respected amongst operators, uh, of which I am one. And usually VC content, it's it's really heavy on theory, but light on practice. And it actually inspired me to start writing a long time ago. And that's how Eric actually found me. And um, one, one of his pitches to, to get me to sign up with Turpentine was that I'd have hopefully uh, a, ch a chance to talk with you here. And so I've been working on these questions, uh, not to freak you out here, for, for you know, a couple months now. And so... The, the first one I wanted to hit you with, Tom, was, you know, VCs are in the game of providing capital, right? But they often have a skew or an area of expertise that they offer to help them differentiate themselves to founders. And for some that I've worked with before, it's pricing, others it's market analysis, and some it's go-to-market strategy. In your writing, you cover a lot of ground. What would you say your skew is at Theory Ventures to differentiate yourself amongst others? I think that the thing that we want to be known for is the depth of our research and our analysis in these domains. Uh, success is hearing a founder say, you understand the space better than another invest, any other investor that you spoke, we've spoken with. And the, the reason we want to be known for that is we think about like launching a rocket, right? If you launch a rocket and it's two degrees one way versus two degrees another, today that may not matter that much, but in 10 years time, over long distances, the net result is pretty meaningfully different. And so if we can be users of the technology or have a deeper appreciation for how to build these companies, do you need a customer success team for an enterprise deployment or do you, is it better suited to a PLG? We hope that we can save companies um, or we can more accurately point the rocket and help more accurately point the rocket at the early stages so that as the businesses pick up steam, there's less, there are fewer corrections and it's a more efficient path to that ultimate moon landing. I like that. I like that. I think there's some formula out there for, uh, for, for speed. It's like velocity times, I don't know, something or other like that. But, um, Tom, you seem to stick with companies and support them for a long time. And that inevitably means there are times when you have to replace a founder or level a founder and bring someone in who's more experienced. I wanted to know, how do you know when it's time to suggest that? And second, is there a preferred way of messaging that that's worked in the past and that you often lean on with operators? So this question, um, I think the best way of doing it is having a consistent open dialogue. And the way that I've gone through this, or we've been through this as boards a few times is we're all strong in certain areas and we're all weak in different areas. And the business needs and demands different things from its leadership, depending on the journey that it takes. What often happens when you need, well, when the board needs to replace a leader is that um, a founder or the current CEO is strong in an area that the business or the business needs the, the CEO to be strong in an area that person isn't very strong in. And the CEO will often seem like exhausted or stressed about it because they're having to learn a skill in real time and it's a challenge. And so uh, in, I'm thinking of at least two or three different scenarios, over the course of a few months, you can pretty quickly see that happening. And I think those conversations, by and large, if they can start from a place of empathy, like, I see you struggling, it's clear that the business needs this, let's figure out the, the right way of introducing that skill set into the business and finding people who are experts. That natural transition is, is ideally the best outcome for a business because then you can bring in a seasoned operator who's strong they can work together for a while, whether it's like as an advisor or a board member. Um, you know, and these processes often take like three to nine months. 
And there needs to be a lot of trust when that transition happens, both with the outgoing CEO and then also, and maybe even more importantly, with the, the management team that's there in place. And so it's not uh, just hiring. It's not a very, very quick hire. So that's the way that it's really done, that I've seen it done well, or at least that's the, those are the better processes that I've seen. That's a super empathetic way of going about it. And I wanted to ask, do you think there's, and you're very data-driven, do you think there's a pattern when this starts to bubble up most commonly, whether that be, you know, a revenue size or number of employees where, you know, the founding team starts to have those struggles? So there's, Teams Will from Zora taught me about this, which is, and there's a blog post somewhere out there, out there that I wrote, which is there are these different, like you think about great teams are structured with a span of control of about seven. So typically a manager is best is working best when they have no more than seven people. And so, you know, first early days of a business, there's a founder and then seven people reporting to that person. Then you have to add another layer of management to the cake and then another layer of management to the cake. And the way that it's described is there's a skill set of managing people. There's a skill set of managing managers of people. There's another skill set, which is managing managers of managers of people and so on. And so there's this like, I think the number is like 837, 144. And it's basically just how many managers do you have and how if they have seven people, what is that layer cake? So that's one dynamic where it can be, I mean, like learning to delegate. I'm stunned that it's not taught in business schools. I have <laughs> needed it and I'm finally getting some training in it. But like, um, that's a very, very difficult skill to learn how to manage through other people. So that's one driver of the needs of companies. The second is there's a strategic shift in the business. So let's assume, um, let's assume the company historically has been product led. And now all of a sudden the market dynamics require that the company move into the enterprise because a competitor has come in and commoditized the low end of the market. That can be another change where you need a more sales oriented leader who has experience managing outbound or large field sales teams. That's also sort of like a big strategic shift that can be a, another pretty important driver. Uh, and then the last is, and probably the most difficult and emotionally fraught are uh, unresolvable disputes amongst the management team about strategy. So if you have two founders who fight or don't see eye to eye, who for some reason or another have grown apart, which happens, uh, th that's another pickle <laughs> that leads to these kinds of situations. How rare in your experience do you think it is that a founder makes it all the way through IPO? I see stats sometimes on, you know, arguing our founder CEOs inherently better because they know the business from, you know, its inception and maybe they're more leaning into taking risks versus professional CEOs. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I think it's really difficult to paint in broad brush strokes one um one path i mean the founder imperative like the the gravitas a founder has within his or her own business is unquestionable there's just a like a respect that the employee population affords to that person for having created this incredible machine um and the hard part i think one of the hardest parts about being a leader of an organization particularly a hyper growth organization is that the business evolves very quickly and the very best leaders are the ones who anticipate what the business will need from them and ensure they either have the skill set or the people around them to meet that need. And so you can do that in a bunch of different ways. You can learn it yourself or hire advisors or build out a management team. And some people are better at doing that than others. Um, and consist, you know, I had this great manager at Google, Kim Scott Malone, who wrote the book Radical Candor, and she taught me the best leaders always manage themselves out of a job. And so the people who are better at doing that, I think, are the ones that scale. But there are success stories. I and mean, what I've learned, I think maybe if I have like one maxim to kind of make this point is there are many ways of getting to the top of the hill. That's what I've learned in venture. Like you can go to, you don't have to go to college. You can go to Harvard or Stanford and you can still be really successful. You can be non-technical and be really successful. You can be technical and really successful. And so... Uh, and I love that part of the valley. Like that's the ethos for me for startup land is that you can come from anywhere and achieve what it is that you want. I think it's the American dream. I think it's very much alive. So 
for me, it's hard to say there's a, there's a hard and fast rule. And I hope, I hope that remains the case for a very long time. I love how you emphasize, you know, the forethought to think what the business will need in the future. And maybe it differs based on how fast the business is growing. But as an operator, I always tend to think higher for the person you need 18 months out from now. What's your take on that? Is that too long of a runway to be thinking forward? No, I think that's right. So the way I think about it is like, if you're a seed stage company, your horizon is three months. That's the business should be planning for three months at the series A you should be thinking maybe like four and a half, five months out. At the Series B, the leadership team is thinking six to nine months out. At the Series C and beyond, it's 15 to 18 months. So what do I mean by that? Well, your product roadmaps need to be longer. When you're seed stage and you're trying to find product market fit, planning beyond three months or even six weeks doesn't make sense because you won't know what necessarily will hit. But by the time you get to be a, a sales leader or a marketing leader of a Series B or a Series C company, you're not thinking about the pipe. You shouldn't be thinking about the pipeline for next quarter. You're thinking about how do I develop the pipeline for three quarters from now? And how do I know that I'll be able to hit that number? And so that sort of, instead of looking at your feet, you're kind of looking more and more to the horizon. So at the point where the business becomes publicly traded, this is awesome quote I just found from Bezos. Uh, I think it was two days ago where he said, I, he would often laugh when analysts, public company analysts would tell him, congrats on a great quarter. And what he was thinking is that quarter was baked three years ago, right? So the work that he had done in order to get that quarter had happened three years before. He's, and so he's thinking three years from now. Um, and so I think that that's a very sort of like natural transition, like looking from your feet to the horizon. I guess to piggyback a bit on the question I, I just asked, I'm a startup CFO. When do you usually counsel your portfolio companies to start thinking about hiring either a VP of finance or, or a CFO? VP of finance is, I think, the best leading. It's not an ARR metric. It's a contract signed metric. So how many, how many sales contracts are coming in within a given period? When does the deal desk need to be established to create some kind of consistency, both within the contracts and then also inform the plan because what you're really looking for is a pipeline to quota ratio that justifies the hiring of a marginal rep or two. Um, and so that needs to be a combination between the sales team and the finance team. And that's when the v VPF uh, should be hired. CFO is later on. Um, I think a CFO, you're probably talking like, and we'll use ARR numbers here, but 25 to 30 million in ARR, something like that. And that's because all of a sudden the, the you have two or three people within the accounting team, a couple of people within the FPNA, FPNA or business intelligence or internal data teams. And then there are other roles that responsibilities that might roll up, like the management of legal functions and that kind of stuff. I love that. You've researched and done a lot of diligence on companies from the traditional Oracle field sales model days to the Atlassian PLG bottoms up build days. Um, in your opinion, across all those different models, you've seen a lot of different CFOs. What qualities do you think separates the good CFOs from the great CFOs that you've had to work with? I think the distinction between a good CFO and a great CFO is great CFOs spend time understanding the world outside the business. So a lot of, a lot of times, I mean, people who come up through the finance org it, it's and it, it's natural, right? Like the, the, the whole goal of the business, the whole goal of that function is to really understand and create a math a model, a mathematical model that describes a machine that is being built in real time. And the great CFOs are the ones who are both able to understand that and then understand the business in its financial context, right? What's happening in terms of the public markets? What's happening in terms of multiples? What are the benchmarks of other businesses? How do we compare? And what sort of what innovations are are other parts of the finance world um, producing that could be interesting, right? So, like in a zero interest rate environment, is debt the right financial instrument in order to finance the business as opposed to equity? Uh, what should we be doing in terms of treasury management? How do we position ourselves vis-a-vis -vis our competitors to have a better financing? Where do we cut spend or increase spend in in order to make ourselves more attractive? I think that's that's a really important step and. Um, the distinction between a good CFO and, and a great CFO. 
I love that because I often counsel people on my finance teams to get outside of your Excel spreadsheet and get out into the company to learn. Like I spend a ton of time with, you know, the product team and also the people in product marketing. So I know what the org's overall strategy is, but what you're hitting on is also get outside the company. And I think that's where investor relations is really important to people because it teaches you how to story tell, but it also makes you like pick your head up every once in a while and say, well, what's going on outside of the four walls of where I work? So that was good. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think in the mind of investors, the CFO has a, the, you know, the CEO will tell a story and the CEO is doing the best possible job to frame the business. And the CFO is the foil. It's the person who brings a more conservative lens. And if both of them can tell a very similar story that is grounded in numbers and the operational history of the business, it just, it drives, it produces this, uh, additional level of confidence in the company's ability to execute. And so that combination, viewing great CFOs, viewing themselves as a counterpart and an important uh, component of the, of the storytelling, is, it's, just, it's a beautiful thing when it happens. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000. That's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamline accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist, designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash turpentine. That's netsuite.com slash turpentine to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash turpentine. Taking the window instead of the middle seat. Outsourcing business tasks that you absolutely hate. What about selling with Shopify? Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Whether you're selling security systems or marketing memory modules, Shopify helps you sell everywhere, from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. I've used it in the past at the companies I've founded, and when we launch merch here at Turpentine, Shopify will be our go-to. Shopify helps turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And Shopify helps you sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. With Shopify Magic, whip up captivating content that converts from blog posts to product descriptions. Generate instant FAQ answers. Pick the perfect email send time, Plus, Shopify magic is free for every Shopify seller. Businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash moment of zen. Go to shopify.com slash moment of zen now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash moment of zen. Tom, talk a little bit about how LPs think about different venture firms, right? Because when Andreessen pitches an LP, it's different than when first round pitches an LP, right? And so why don't you explain a little bit the, the land of LPs and the different kinds of LP products that are better suited for, for you know, in terms of matches between VCs and, and LPs? Why don't you give a little bit of a, uh, of a lay of the land there? Okay, great. So let's talk about the universe of LPs. And then let's talk about the financial products that venture capitalists offer to LPs. So let's cut it up in that way. The, there are many different kinds of LPs, right? There are individuals, family offices, then there's uh, endowments and foundations, fund of funds, and then like pension plans and healthcare plans. And each one of those has an, a different investment mandate. Endowments and foundations are typically much more focused on privates because of Swenson's influence. And then others... And what I mean by that is like 30 to 40% of assets, maybe sometimes more will be in private. So about 80% of that will be in 
private equity and buyout, and then single digit percent will be in venture capital. And then a lot of LPs might have one, one or 2% in venture capital total. And the way they think about it is if you're a diversified LP, you have public company, public equities positions with hedge funds, and you might have index funds. And that, that's a big chunk. That's probably 40% of your book. And that is super liquid. And, and it's meant to drive an S&P or marginally better than an S&P like return. And then you have uh, private equity and buyout, which is meant to drive something like a call it 15 to 18% IRR. And then you have venture capital, which is the most expensive, longest duration, least liquid asset class, which is a small percentage of portfolio, but is meant to drive a lot of alpha. That's typically the way that LPs think about it. And that's because we raise funds for 10 years with like two one-year extensions is pretty typical, although some firms are raising with 15 years. So that, that's the way that they kind of see the whole universe. You know, this kind of dawned on me during our fundraising where when a startup raises, it raises a seed and then an A and then a B and then a C and then a D. And the return expectations for each round change, right? If you invested a seed, you might expect like a 100x or a 1,000x in the case of a really successful company. And at the A, your multiple is less because... You know, maybe you're expecting like a 20x and then at the series B, maybe you're expecting like a 5x and the series C, you're expecting a 2x and a 3x and it asymptotes as you approach the IPO. It's the same for venture firms, right? So the way that LPs look at an emerging fund or a first-time fund is on average, first-time funds tend to produce when they're successful, much higher multiples. And so that's a seed round. And then a second fund vintage typically is a little bit bigger. And so that's the A and then the third one is a B and then by the time you get to be a multi-stage, multi-platform fund where you're offering 17 different products to LPs, that's like an IPO stage, public company stage return profile. Uh, and so that's that's my mental model for it. If you were um, sort of explaining kind of like what you think would happen to multi-stages over the next um, decade, um, what, what do you think would uh, would happen? Or I should say firms that have agglomerated uh, or accumulated a lot of AUM and are you know raising a, investing across every every stage do you think that those firms continue the same strategy um do you think that they change their strategies what advice might might you give them or, or what would you do if you if you were those firms and sitting on a ton of capital right now but knowing that the uh you know overall capital set will uh will decrease over time i think the the larger you are the the greater the likelihood you remain in the ecosystem um and that's just because as an LP, if I've decided to invest $250 million or $500 million with you, that's a 20 or a 30-year commitment. And unless something goes seriously wrong, I will probably keep that commitment or increase it with inflation or even more. Um, and so the way that I think about, like, if you're a multi-stage, multi-strategy asset, I mean, you're, you're an asset manager. And the goal there is uh, the firm has built a fundraising brand with both LPs and startups that allows it to hire people. And when those people come in, the brand in the calling card produces high response rates from customers on both sides, both the institutional investors and the startups. And the goal is to con to drive consistency and performance. That's the ultimate goal. It's, um, it's trying to get to, you know, and some people might disagree, but it's trying to get to the beta of the asset class for larger and larger dollar sizes. It's trying to sustain, okay, an LP puts in 250 million, 500 million, a billion. What is the top quartile return for the asset class? Great, can I have that in a really, really large check size? That's the product that's being offered. And the way that it's done is across all these different strategies. So I think those, you know, the multi-stage, multi-asset firms, they will continue to exist. I would argue that they would thrive. There are a lot of parallels between what's happening in the venture capital industry and what happened to private equity. So the, the original buyouts happened in the 1970s when KKR spun out, I think, of Bear uh, Stearns. And for about 20 years, it was a very, very small cottage industry. And then in the 80s, it was Milken and the junk bond market that really blew the private equity market up. And they, they went from single strategy firms to multiple strategy firms. Now KKR, huge asset manager, many of them are publicly traded. And I think that evolution 40 years later is exactly what's happening in the venture. So do you think that these these firms will 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 be publicly traded or that some of them may? I think some of them either, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um you know, you have like Iconic has gone from 0 to 75 billion in AUM in 
10 years. Uh, Dreesen, I think the last time I looked was like zero to 35 billion uh, in a similar time frame. And there are publicly traded asset managers that are at that scale. So uh, I think it's a firm by firm decision. I don't know anything about anybody's particular strategy, but there's no reason why they shouldn't or couldn't be uh, publicly traded. Do you think that they will also get into different, like, uh, sort of public market investing or sort of real estate or just kind of things that have nothing to do with venture? I think so. I mean, I think, you know, the goal of most businesses is just to continue to increase in size. And if we trace like the history of venture capital, right, it was initially just like seed stage and then there's mid stage and then there's growth stage. And uh, we talked about the hedge funds cross, crossing over, investing between public and private equity, offering that product. And some venture firms have started um, uh, high net worth individual uh, asset management, right? So they're in that business and uh, a couple of firms have started secondaries businesses where they buy existing LP and GP stakes. So that's another financial product. Uh, one firm that I know of has started like a structured credit product that lends dollars to companies that may or may not be in the portfolio. So now all of a sudden there's there's a debt product in there. And so starting from like a three to $5 million check, all of a sudden you have all these different flavors matrix that over a bunch of different geographies and you have a pretty complex product suite. And again, like the, if you think about the ultimate business of an asset manager, uh, it's about uh, being able to deliver returns and building a brand on both sides where LPs will take your call and, and founders will take your call. And so if you continue to expand and you have that brand and you can hire some great people to use it effectively, it's kind of your, um, it's your motivation, right? Where capital capitalist is in is in the job title, so uh, I think that's I think that's where we end up. Yeah, you're bearish on sort of the the economy in, in the short to medium term. If if I if I recall, you think there was a bit of an overcorrection, um, and as a result, I, th I think you believe that rates will be uh, if not high, you know, not super low. Certainly not what they what they have been the, the past decade. Um, is that true? And if so, does that mean that you're bearish on industries that kind of uh, depend on, on on low rates or, or unpack that a little bit? So the futures market, the last time I looked at it, the bond market is pricing a rate cut in uh, Q3, Q4 of 24. The dynamic is there's a convexity to the curve. So uh, cutting one percentage point from five and a half to four and a half. Yes, it's one percentage point cut and it has some impact, but cutting it from two to one has much more impact on what happens in, in the economy. So I think, um, but the economy is strong and, uh, or at least that's what the numbers say. And what we're starting to see finally is like, you look at like the data dog earnings, a couple of other companies that, that Microsoft earnings, people are starting to see a bottom where the growth, the decline in growth rates has stopped. And some of them are picking up growth again. Uh, it's not broad, but you're starting to see some, and even in the private markets, a bunch of portfolio companies are starting to get their footing underneath them after missing a couple quarters. And then the earnings surprise, which is a measure of how much more positive the, the earnings are for public companies is off the charts for a lot of software businesses. So I think we're, you know, who am I to predict, but um, I think we're at a place where we're kind of touch, we're closer touching the bottom. And I would expect that like the back half of next year is stronger. Gartner, again, trying to predict the future, but you know, their overall numbers for growth, they predicted in 22, 9% software growth year over year in 23, which is this year is 13%. Next year, they've raised the expectations to 14%. So there are a lot of positive signs, I think, for call it two to three years from now that you'll have good positive multiple expansion and, and there'll be a lot of appetite for, uh, for software. Yeah, there are a lot of firms over the past few years, um, you know, there were SaaS specific firms or, or fintech specific firms that it feels like were built for a for a previous economy, but now we're entering uh, sort of a, a world in which rate, rates are higher and thus the the sort of multiples, um, you know, we can't expect kind of the same same ones we've, we've been having. Do, do you think, do you agree with that that framework? Do you think that's unique to um, SaaS or fintech or, or just kind of across the board? Or what, what, is, what does it mean for, for those two sectors in particular? Yeah, I, so I think so. Software, the median publicly traded multiple over the last fifteen years about five point five x forward revenues to EV to enterprise value, and we went through a period where like Snowflake traded like eighty nine times forward, and there were a lot of companies in the thirty to fifty. I think base case for a fast growing company, you're looking at a multiple of something like eight to fifteen, depending on how hot the market perceives it, and we need to underwrite 
those investment cases to those multiples. Um, and that's the way that it was for a really long time before we went into the zero interest rate environment. So what does that mean? Well, it means the cost of capital is significantly higher than it was. And the, you know, there was a study on the cost of customer acquisition for software companies where over the last five years, it's increased 60% during that time. Well, so what does that mean? Well, in a zero interest rate environment, it's fine because you can raise 60% more dollars and you can grow at the same rate. You just pay the market fee for a new user, or new customer. But in an environment where the capital is more expensive, that means that startups, they either need to give up more of their uh, cap table to be able to grow at the same rate, or they must evolve to find a less expensive way of growing. And, um, and so I think the major driver, the major change in software will be what are the new go-to-market strategies that are much more capital efficient? And like open source was one for a while. Product-led growth was one for a while. There are these iterations. There are platform shifts. Mobile acquisition was the third. Uh, and we'll be looking, I think we'll be looking here in the next couple of years for an innovative way of acquiring customers. We could argue that like the rippling suite strategy is another way of doing it. Uh, where offering a whole bunch of bundled products as a single package uh, is an innovation that uh, is a pretty market departure from the best of breed last 15 years that Salesforce catalyzed. I just wanted to ask one more. So I, I was going for a run this morning and I was listening to your blockbuster appearance on the HR Heretics podcast, another Turpentine pod. Um, it, it's awesome. And you you made me feel pretty positive about the world. Uh, not like the interest rate part of things, but just it being a good time for young, ambitious people to step up and take a bigger role within their organization would you mind just, you know, kind of quickly restating why you think this is a good time for people who are trying to get their first taste of the C-suite and take that step up role? I think it's an incredible time if you're like uh, an up and comer, because one, you have massive technology changes that need to be understood. And typically younger people are the first ones to gravitate to that. Two, I think the dynamics around compensation are such that a lot of more senior executives have seen a lot of financial success and um, and so may not be interested in entering in like an earlier mid-stage company. The, a third reason it's a really interesting time is that because startups can't raise as, as much capital as they could in the past and VPs are expensive, not only do they cost more on a cash basis, but they typically manage as opposed to being like a player coach. And so there's an opportunity to kind of step up into a role, be more capital efficient, know the space deeper than, than an incumbent and, um, and, and really grow into a role. And you can look at it even within the LP base, the number of CIOs that retired post COVID because they knew there was three or four years of pain in front of, uh, in front of those investment programs was huge. Uh, and I, I think you saw the same thing within the world of startups where people cashed in their chips and they said, go play golf or paddle or pickle. Um, and so that's an awesome time, I think, to be uh, a young up and comer and, and really um, make a mark on the world. I love that. Maybe gearing towards, uh, towards closing here, uh, why don't you talk about the future of, of theory? What, what do you hope that, uh, that this looks like in a, in a few years? Um, you know, we've seen firms like, like USV and Benchmark kind of, um, you know, stick to their knitting and, and have their ideal fund size and stay the same. And we've also seen firms like, like Thrive and ACCZ and Founders Fund and Sequoia, you know, add more product lines and, and aggregate AUM and, and both types of, of, of firms have had uh, massive success. So how do you, how do you think about where, where you go from here? For sure. We have, we have a multi-decade strategy document that everybody who joins the firm reads and think that for the first, you know, McKinsey has three horizons. Our first horizon is we need to prove one that we can um, attract the right limited partner base Two that we can hire the right team. And then three demonstrate that the idea behind our model of this like thesis driven concentrated approach resonates in the market and, um, and we can win, we can win in competitive situations. And so I think for funds one and funds two, that's the objective is to demonstrate that the model works and, uh, and in the medium term, it's about continuing to use math to make sure that the numbers are on our side to generate really high multiple funds. That's our North Star. Fund three, fund four, what do you think fund size would be? 
That's a good, well, the market will determine it, right? So I think we'll remain very, very concentrated. And the, the goal is, is to be, um, a really strong capital partner to start up. So what it is today, I mean, I, I, I hesitate to paint a number because I, I don't know yet. We haven't run that math. Um, but we'll, Assume we will. And how do you determine the right amount of companies per fund? What is sort of the ideal concentration versus what's what's not enough companies or or, or what's uh, what's too many? Yeah, well, so from an LP's point of view, they're already so massively diversified that I think many of them prefer highly concentrated funds because if if a company works within a fund, they really want it to move that part of their portfolio, and so ideally they'd be much more concentrated. From the GP's perspective, the more concentrated a f- firm is, the greater the risk that we take as on the capital, I mean, on with our commitment. Um, and so, but our goal is to be much, on the much more concentrated side. And that's, I mean, if you think about it, like a power law, we all know that shape, uh, the median and the average of a power law are zero. So the more diversified a portfolio becomes, the harder it is to generate a high multiple fund. And we want as much of our capital as close to the y-axis as possible. So the longer term strategy is to continue to create funds that allow us to do that. And, and let me ask a question. I'm very curious. What do you think about the future for, for accelerators and, and, and sort of organizations like YC? Do you think they get kind of chipped away or, or as the sort of seed stage ecosystem becomes more aggregate uh, fragmented, or do you think it actually consolidates um, and, and their you know, power only uh, expands? I think, I think there'll always be a place for them. I, y Combinator in particular has built a phenomenal brand, uh, and they serve a couple different roles. The first is education. Uh, and then the second is building a network. I kind of think about like Y Combinator and that echelon of a seed as an alternative to a, an MBA in a certain way. Because what's the point of an MBA? Well, you learn a little bit about business, maybe a lot about business, and then you build a network of people who ultimately can help you be their customers and people you recruit. And so it's kind of like a vocational MBA in a sense. Um, and there'll always be a place uh, for those kinds of people. And one of the reasons is they, they also tend to fund much more diverse cohorts of startups. So, um, you know, there are crypto accelerators, there are hardware accelerators. It might take the rest of the venture ecosystem some time to come uh, up to speed on it. So I think it's, it's um, something that's here to stay for sure. And it's a, it's a good part of the ecosystem. It's, a, it's a, an education part of the ecosystem. Yeah, let's uh, l- l- let's wrap on that, uh, Tom. This has been a great uh, great episode. Thank you so much for joining CJ and I and sharing uh, your wisdom and, and learnings with us. Such a privilege to be with you guys, and I appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Turpentine VC is a podcast from Turpentine, the network behind Moment of Zen and Econ 102. If you like the episode, please leave a review in the Apple Store or rate us on Spotify.